Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you guys for joining us today for a panel discussion on configuration versus customization and how to get more out of your PeopleSoft. Um, we've got a panel joining us today that will be moderated by Robin Valadam, Senior Director, Product Strategy. A couple of things to let you guys know before we get started. All your phone lines are muted, but if you have questions, feel free to jump through the question module um, and we'll ask those questions as they come in and have an interactive conversation with the panelists. Um, also want to let you guys know um, there are a couple of poll questions. We'll let you guys know when those launch, but we'd ask that you guys just take the time to answer those questions for us and we'll show back the results to you all as soon as we're done with them. Um, again, you guys, have, um, phone lines are muted, so if you have questions, drop them through the question module and we'll get answers for you guys throughout the session. So at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to Robin to kick us off for the panel discussion. All right, thank you, Christina, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone who's uh, joining us through the webinar. Thanks again to Quest for putting this on. Um, I think um, <clears throat> with what's going on these days, um, one of the best ways to stay connected with what, what's going on with PeopleSoft and uh, to understand um, uh, all the different things that are happening within the PeopleSoft community, best way to get connected is through these webinars. So appreciate that. Um, so our panel discussion today is going to be about configuration versus customization. Pretty big topic, uh, which is why we wanted to make it a panel discussion. And I um, invited a couple customers and a couple partners um, to participate and thankfully they accepted so i'm really happy to be able to to have more than just me talking about configuration versus customization in fact my job today is just going to moderate i'd like for you to really hear from our customers and from our partners that deal with this on a regular basis even on a daily basis so um, that's what we're going to do i've got some questions that i'm going to ask of the panelists um, and then we're going to take questions during the chat or in the chat so as you um, have questions, please feel free to put in the chat your question. And then whenever it's appropriate, I'll try to get that question in to ask the panelists. If we don't get questions from the chat, then I'll just continue on with my list of questions, which is primarily based upon the types of questions I get from customers as part of my, my role with, uh, with Oracle and PeopleSoft is I get to meet with a lot of customers and I get to hear their, their questions and their concerns, okay? So um, I want to first, um, before we move any further, introduce our panelists and have them introduce themselves, actually. So let's first start with um, Pam. Pam, would you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about Hennepin County's uh, PeopleSoft footprint? Sure. Uh, my name is Pam Demick with Hennepin County uh, in Minnesota. Um, I'm an IT manager with uh, the PeopleSoft implementation here, and I've been in my role for about six years. Um, been with Hennepin County over 30, and and most of my career has been as a financial user um, and managing finances. So I have a lot of perspective from the end user, ultimate end user of the system, and I've worked in many different departments. So I have a bunch of different business perspectives on how to use the system, and so my role now. Um, I have nine functional analysts. I'm responsible for the finance um, modules, and it is a lot of fun. Um, go ahead if you want to go to that next slide. So a little bit about head of, whoops, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little bit about Hennepin County's implementation of PeopleSoft. So we just went live May 18th with tools 857.12. Uh, we are um, current through image 30 on the finance side, and we selectively adopted um, 31 and 32 portions. Um, on HCM side, we're current through image 31, and on ELM, we're current through image 18. Um, we have an Oracle Linux um, infrastructure. We're in the process of updating our database to 19C. And that's going to be going live on July 10th. Uh, we do use PTF. Um, we started a long time ago, and anyone that wants to reach out to me outside of this to talk about what our journey been like, I will certainly share that. But I will say that we're on the right path right now, and we actually do work with a lot of local people, um, uh, local organizations like the University of Minnesota. Uh, we've met with the state of Minnesota. Um, and we share our ideas and thoughts around this product. 
Um, and then we also have uh, Paymentus being used as our online payment solution as the provider. We are looking, um, we're in the process of implementing e-billing. And we also use iNova as our cashiering application, which ultimately integrates with our general ledger. You can see the different modules that we're using. Um, we have a pretty widespread use of the system and we use portal um, to connect it all together as a first landing point for our employees. And then on the supplier side, we do have a supplier portal put up and we are about to implement the customer portal for the use of e-billing. All right, great. Thanks, Pam. Appreciate yep. that. Um, let me bring in um, Sally. Sally, will you introduce yourself and your organization? You have to unmute yourself. Are you on mute, Sally? Sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, Sally Huff with Westfield Insurance, which is a property and casualty insurance and banking company. Um, we have approximately 2,500 um, active employees, and I'm a senior HRMS analyst. I've been working with Westfield for about 18 years. Um, my hire date was one day after we went go live with PeopleSoft, so I've been working with PeopleSoft the entire time. Um, we're currently on HCM uh, 9.2, image 33, and uh, we just upgraded to PeopleTools 857.12 in the beginning of May. Excellent. Thanks, Sally, and welcome to the panel. Um, Larry, why don't you introduce yourself and your organization? All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Larry Zagata. Uh, I'm with Micro Consulting, VP of Delivery. So I'm responsible for our engagements, our consulting, our project management methodology. Also responsible for uh, keeping up for the organization on the latest and greatest tools, configuration tools, all the different options as things uh, grow and, and uh, are distributed. And then MyPro, um, we specialize in PeopleSoft. That's our primary focus. It's our passion. We've been around since 2005, and we do everything PeopleSoft, whether it's upgrades or implementations, optimizations, uh, et cetera. Thanks, Rob. Excellent. Thanks, Larry. Welcome. And uh, finally, let's uh, turn over to Tiger. Tiger, introduce yourself, please. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Tiger Barrett. I am the uh, CEO and uh, founder of PS Web Solution. Um, uh, basically, my title is PeopleSoft Evangelist. Uh, we were uh, formed in uh, 2001, and we specialize in PeopleSoft solutions and helping customers, you know, achieve maximum ROI with those solutions. Trying to, you know, start off as fixing gaps and making people's life easier and more use, more user friendly. Um, and you know, our solutions were always built from the ground up using configuration from day one. That was a, a big mantra of ours. So. When the PeopleSoft started embracing that, we we've been very tied to this uh, this movement. I want to call it because it's really made a big impact on how PeopleSoft has become. Um, to me, was an industry leader, lost its way for a little bit, and now I think it's back uh, because uh, I was just doing a presentation uh, 20 minutes ago about how uh, you know why do you have these PeopleSoft applications? Well, they're industry leading. Um, now that they've got the ability to have this configuration that we're going to talk about, uh, I think they, they're right up there in the space as uh, back as industry leader. All right. Thanks, Tiger. Appreciate that. Welcome. So um, let's go ahead and start our discussion. Um, and I wanted to first start it off by uh, showing you some of the configuration frameworks that are available and just kind of set the context. So um, customization is something that we see as an advantage with PeopleSoft. You know, as part of your license, you get the tool set, you get the application, you get all the delivered objects, all the fields, the records, the components, the menus, the people code, the content references, the queries, everything, right? And it's up to you if you want to customize anything that's delivered by us as a development team to make it fit exactly what you're looking for in your organization or what your business wants. Uh, once out of the system, right? And of course, over the years, that's what customers have done, either on their own or they've used uh, folks like Larry and Tiger to do it for them in their environment to make the system work exactly the way they want it to work. And to us, we feel that's an advantage and customers tell me that all the time. They, they feel that that's an advantage for them in their industry um, or an advantage for them just in their work. 
uh, to be able to, to do that. So as long as you have the, the, the tool set, you will always be able to do customizations. Now, over time, what we've seen is that the more customizations you do to the delivered objects that we deliver, um, the more time it takes to get current, right? The more time it takes to update your system. And so what we have done and what we've started to do uh, as, as a PeopleSoft development organization is to start to deliver configuration frameworks. That's what we call them, configuration frameworks. You can look at them as configuration options. Uh, there's a number of different terms that can be used, but we view them as ways that you can, or tools that you can use to extend the system, to make the system do what you want it to do um, without having to go in and change the code, right? Um, and so the changes would then be handled differently when you go to get current or when you go to update um, and later down the road, and it's not as expensive, it doesn't take as much time, it's not as expensive for you to do that. So that's the context of what we're talking about today. Um, here's a list of just some of the configuration frameworks that have, have been available for quite some time. Some of them are new, like the Kibana Analytics, the Chatbot Integration Framework, Delegation Framework just recently came out. And some of them have been around for a while, like the Approval Workflow Engine, which I, fit, I consider a framework in and of itself. Um, and many of these frameworks are, are things that we use in development to deliver end user functionality only because we feel like number one, it'll help you with um, updates later on, but number two, um, you can easily extend it and we don't have to try to deliver and meet every single use case that our customers have, right? We can deliver the baseline using the framework and then you all can use the framework to extend it to make it do what you want it to do. So that's the context of what we're talking about here. Um, I'll leave the list up um, uh, for now, uh, and then and then in a bit I'll I'll um, I'll take it I'll take it offline. Um, so I want to start with the first question for our panelists. And uh, now that we kind of know the context, um, tell us a little bit about your decision making process these days for customizing PeopleSoft because we know things have evolved, right? So um, can you tell us what types of customizations are you doing these days? Um, um, even though there may be some configuration frameworks available, but what are the types of customizations that you're doing today? Um, and maybe I'll first start with, with Pam. Pam, can you share a little bit about what are the types of customizations you guys look at doing today? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Okay, I just have seen some disruption in my internet. So, um, so the question about what are we doing right now with, um, customizing our environment? Is that the first question? I'm sorry. Yes, that's it. Okay, so um, as far as customizations, we do have them at Hennepin, and really they all started uh, mostly when we implemented 10 years ago. Uh, we were more focused on implementing a new system and changing um, the imp what that would do or impact our customers. Um, versus wanting to change their business process a lot. We were doing some centralizing of um, like our AP area and our AR area where it used to be distributed. And so um, customizations were implemented back then. Since then, we really um, don't do a lot of customizations if we don't have to. Um, Back then we had a lot of consultants helping us and now we just don't have the bandwidth to do it. And we've been in the system long enough that we have the experience to say and kind of push back on our, our users, you might need to change your business process in order to, um, to adapt better to a countywide enterprise system. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Sally, what about with, with Westfield? Do you guys kind of take the same approach? Maybe customizations have slowed, slowed down a little bit over the time? Um, I would say they have slowed down some. Obviously, we make sure there's a business need. And of course, now, you know, if there is something we look at the, um, you know, workflow or there's configurations instead of customization to see if that's possible before doing a customization. So event mapping, for example, yeah, and I want to I want to dig into that a little bit more. Um, I'll come back to you, Sally, on that one, on that particular point. 
Uh, Larry, uh, what types of customizations are you seeing from your customers? What's what, what are some of the things that you've seen change maybe over time where you focus more on? Yeah, I think most the vast majority of our customers anyway are in the same similar situation where most of the customizations have been around for a very long time and they're they existed because that's that was the option at the time. They're strategic, they're they're required. But moving forward, we've been seeing a lot less of that and more take, trying to take advantage of the configuration frameworks, um, a lot of uh, related actions, a lot of paid and field configurator to take care of the, the, the smaller page changes. Um, so most of the customizations are the ones that they go through an evaluation process and decide that it really is strategic uh, to their organization and the configuration uh, framework won't take care of it. Uh, so, but more and more, um, less and less customizations and, and more configuration. Yeah, but you're seeing that from a strategic perspective, there's a demand for it. Make those yes. Types of, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And Tiger, how about you? What are you seeing from customization perspective? So we've been trying to help customers realize that a lot of this configuration has even been introduced. It's kind of been started off as a slow trickle, even though it's been almost two and a half, two and a half to three years now since some of the very first, well, I'm going to consider event mapping uh, tools have been released. Uh, so we're, we're really trying to help customers realize that these tools are out there and how impactful they are. And, you know, it's not even so much doing new customizations, but how can we help them focus to remove their old customizations? So many customers are still on early PUM versions or they're on 9.1 still, and they, they don't, they can't get off because it's just too much of a, of an upgrade process. So, uh, doing these kind of sessions and, and helping, helping our customers not only do it when they decide to do it, but just letting them know that there are options out there. Most, uh, many customers, especially a couple of years ago when, you know, there's a lot of turmoil in the industry. Uh, customers are just like, it's too expensive to upgrade. Let's just look at a, a cloud solution or going somewhere else. And uh, I think that I believe that these configuration options have really allowed people to see the, you know, hey, we can stay on PeopleSoft if we are able to remove these customizations and get these, you know, to basically make it much cheaper to own and maintain PeopleSoft. So a little bit of both between do we you know, use these tools for the new, new changes that we want or how do we get to keep PeopleSoft as a solution, uh, it helps make it viable. Yeah, that's a great point you make there, Tiger, because, you know, in the past, we would um, get feedback from customers saying, hey, you know, the, user, the UI needs to get updated or else we're going to move off the PeopleSoft platform. And that's when we introduced Fluid. Um, and then we, uh, we heard um, about the lifecycle management, how it was taking us too long to deliver new features. And then we introduced POM. And now uh, we hear from customers, you know, the more they get customized, the harder it is to get current. And then that opens up um, discussion around, well, do we need to stay on the PeopleSoft platform? So that's why we feel like having all of this, um, uh, all these frameworks can help customers move, uh, move away from customizing more and more in the future and relying more on the configuration. Um, I want to go back to what, Sally, what you had said earlier, and it actually directly relates to one of the questions we got in chat. Because um, you mentioned that before you customize, you start to look at what configuration framework may be available for you to use. Can you tell us a little bit about how do you keep up to date with what um, configure frame, configuration frameworks are out there? And what is your process for um, figuring out which one you should actually use um, to help you? So one big thing. And I know some of the things that I learned about were just attending conferences like Collaborate or Reconnect, um, you know, watching the YouTube videos online, people books, and then, you know, networking with other um, companies. So I know with, um, we'll work sometimes collaboratively with the developers, so I'm purely functional um, to, um, they'll analyze it to see if event mapping would be a better option than trying to con uh, kind of customize it. Um, and then, yeah, just I know, for example, we used uh, page and field configurator because we had been at a conference and heard about it. Then we went back to do something and we said, we want to hide that field and well, let's try that out. And it was actually mm -hmm. very easy to use from what we found. We haven't mm -hmm. gotten too complex with the page and field configurator, just hiding fields and mapping or masking the social security number for right now. But. Yeah. Yeah, taking incremental steps isn't a bad way to learn, right? To learn how to use it, feel comfortable with what it can and can't do, while still seeing some measurable benefit uh, where you're actually masking a field, for example. Um, 
how about, how about you, Pam? Anything to add to that as far as your process for um, reviewing configuration frameworks and figuring out which one would be the best to use? Yeah, I would I would echo the same thing um, as far as how we learn all of those. It's conferences and webinars and um, people books, YouTube, social media, Facebook and Twitter. Um, you know, we continuously um, take these image updates and we do these these reviews. And as we're doing that, um, we know when Page and Field Configurator came out, that seemed like an easy win for us um, and our team. First, you know, being the functionals, we actually watched some of those YouTube videos that were pro published um, as a group. And then our team broke off individually to try and figure out where would we want to use them. And a, and a team came back and then showed the rest of the, the team what they did and how they did it. And um, that was the best way for us to learn about it and implement it. Um, and we continue to. We've We've done a lot of different um, pages in almost all of our modules, and our all, my entire team has experience using it. Yeah, so having a little bit of a point person to kind of learn the feature and then come back and train everybody else uh, on what yeah. I could do, that's probably a, a really good idea considering that you see the whole list that we have of things there. It's kind of hard for just one person to know it all, um, you know, unless you're a partner and then the partners, you know, really dive into into all of these, but you know, you also have your regular day job, so uh, there's only so much that uh, you can kind of uh, learn about. So that's not a bad idea having a point person. Um, I have a follow up to that for Larry and Tiger. Before I do that, Christina, can we do our first poll question? I, I, I'd be interested to see how many of folks on our call are technical versus functional. Yeah, not a problem at all. So for the folks on the phone, I just launched the poll. So it, the question is, how would you best describe your role at your organization? Mostly functional, mostly technical, both functional and technical, or management? Um, we'll give it about 45 seconds to a minute or so here. Let's see. Looks like right now the mostly technical is ahead of everything. Okay. Let's give it, uh, we're about 56% of the votes right now. Let's give it another 20 to 30 seconds. So again, um, how would you best describe your role at your organization? Mostly functional, mostly technical, both functional and technical or management. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get ready to close it. Right, about 80% of you guys have voted, so get your last votes in here. I'm going to go ahead and close and share the results back. So. The question again is, how would you best describe your role at your organization? Um, and we actually have 21% that are saying they're mostly functional, 52% saying they're mostly technical, 18% say they're both functional and technical, while 9% are in management. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, so that's not surprising considering the types of questions that are coming through chat for me. So um, this, this is great. So um, uh, I'll start with Larry and then go to Tiger to, to follow up on this as well. So um, one of the questions that's in chat, I'm going to paraphrase. It's a little bit long in chat, but I'll just paraphrase, and it kind of uh, leads into what we, we were just talking about. So if, if as a customer or even as a partner, um, we often rely on the skill set that we have, and everybody on this call can probably go and build a page in App Designer, build a component out in App Designer, probably in their sleep, um, and do it quite easily because we've been doing it for so long. What, what is the tipping point uh, for when you should use or look at a configuration framework? So we know how we keep up to date with them, but what, what's that tipping point for you where you say, you know what, based on what you're trying to do here, we should look at a configuration framework? Larry, I'd, I'd like to start with you first. Yeah, I, I think overall our strategy is we should be looking at configuration frameworks first, right? Because that can avoid customizations and avoid the overhead that goes with it. So we do a, uh, we try to do as much education as we can, both with our, our internal consultants and our customers in terms of what's new. As it comes out, we're evaluating the, the PUM uh, features. We're looking at the CFO tool. We have constantly updating our demo environments to make sure we have the latest and greatest and everybody's trained and, and tuned in on the, the, the latest uh, tool set. As part of the development process and design process, you know, what we want to do is make sure that in the design specs, for example, we're asking the questions and checkbox, have you considered these 
frameworks? Have you considered using page and field configuration? Have you considered using event mapping before you proceed to go and do the actual uh, customization itself? So we're trying to look at configuration first before customization. Now, ultimately, you still have to customize. But let's try to avoid it as much as possible. And that checklist is just to avoid that old habit that you mentioned of, I've always done it this way. I can open up App Designer and do it in five minutes. But that five minutes carries a lot of baggage uh, for the organization. So let's let's look at uh, configuration first. Yeah. Tiger, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, we, we've really just been trying to, to preach to the, you know, preach the gospel. Uh, everybody knows, you know, we can technically do it. Everybody already is customized. Uh, so we've been really trying to use the platform of the Quest and the conferences and the webinars to to make people aware of these options and, and, and case studies that were where customers have gone out and actually been successful using these tools. A lot of times people don't hear them through the fluff. They go, oh, yeah, another configuration, this and that. Uh, I don't believe it. But when you have a case study uh, or you have you know actual customers like Pam and Sally, that actually can talk about, yeah, we're doing it and it saved us. And then here's what, you know, here was the end result. Uh, so it, it's really just been, uh, you know, talking about the tools, educating customers that they are out there and how they work and what it takes to use them and that how other customers have been successful um, has been, I think, the biggest role we've really had, not just physically helping them do it in some cases, but that they're even available. There are still customers who aren't aware or really even know what event mapping is. And it's been almost three years since it's been out. Um, you know, in my opinion, it's probably one of the biggest enhancements and features that people saw just introduced since they went to the web in People Tools 8. It's just that powerful. It's a game changer as far as, uh, as the plumbing and, and the ability to make the software live a lot longer. Because yeah. you can now keep the best of breed functionality, but make it do what you wanted to do, which was also one of the biggest benefits of PeopleSoft. Its greatest strength was the ability to go in people tools and make changes to the application. Nobody really does it like that. Um, yep. But it's also its biggest weakness because everybody went in and made changes yeah. and they get stuck in this hole. Now you get to do both. And there's more of a trend to move away from giving you the ability to make those changes, right? So. Right. Right. Um, so not, so just removing, I, I, not just removing, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead, Tiger, finish your thought, please. No, I'll just say, not just for removing or lifting and shifting your customizations, but once you get that, but new ones going forward, as new functionality comes out that PeopleSoft is actively releasing. That's the other thing I hear all the time. Well, PeopleSoft hasn't done anything new in you know, 10 years, and I'm like, uh, actually, they're doing something new every three months. So, Yep. No, that's a good point. Um, so just to add to what you guys said, um, we do that internally as well. When we get a feature request from a customer, or if we've got a we've got something from our focus group or a cab or just an initiative that we are building out for our roadmap, the first thing we look at is what framework can we use to deliver this feature? Um, so we're doing the same thing, Larry, what you mentioned, and I think you mentioned too, Sally, we do the same thing. We kind of look and see, well, what can we do with the framework? And to that person that asked a question about, you know, kind of what is that tipping point? Um, you know, if, if we feel like the framework is overkill for the feature that we're doing, then we won't use the framework. But keep in mind that most functionality that you build out, especially for us, um, doesn't stand still. It usually expands. It's just what we know of today that we end up delivering. But things can evolve the next year and the year after that and year after that. And that's when you really see the value of leveraging a framework because then you just go in and make a change, a, a small change. Maybe you add a template. Well, prime example, we did that with offboarding. We use an activity guide to do onboarding and then we delivered a template for offboarding instead of having to deliver a whole new set of functionality for offboarding. So uh, something to keep in mind that leveraging the framework, maybe it seems a little overkill for the feature you're trying to do now, but it may put you in a better position in the future. Um, I'd like to um, ask you guys, so so Tiger mentioned event mapping, which for him is a game changer. And I've heard that from a lot of a lot of our partners and some of our customers that have gotten into the details of event mapping, because it, it does allow you to kick off processes before and after, you know, you save to your components. Um, I'd like for you guys to each just pick pick a framework that maybe it's one of the ones that you see listed on the slide here that you've worked with and tell, tell the, um, Tell the audience a little bit about your experience, um, you know, good and bad, 
I guess, um, with with that framework. So, um, Pam, can I ask you to go first and maybe just uh, pick pick one that uh, that you that you're familiar with? Uh, well, I'm I'm torn between two. Uh, so, page and field configurator versus nav collections and dashboards. So, Sally, if you're going to choose page and field, <laughs> I can talk about nav nav collections. <laughs> Um, I say the one I, I probably so, know more about NAV collections, but either one's fine. <laughs> oh well. Uh, okay, which one do you want? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll I'll talk I'll talk page and field configurator then, because um, I've actually presented on this before, and and what I would say about that product, um, how Hennepin has used it, like I was describing earlier, uh, everyone that's a a functional learned about it and it's been a game changer in the sense of we haven't we have removed some customizations but more for us we have been able to change that user experience for the better an example of that would be we didn't want to do a customization on what some of the pages look like so we just lived with it but in our travel and expense area our users we have you know over 9000 users in the county that could be filling out expense reports. And as you see those screens, we have now hennepinized the terminology on those pages, changing the field names, hiding those field names, um, making it so much user friendly for them that they are able to complete the form without uh, asking their um, travel and expense coordinator how to do it because they understand themselves what it actually means and what they're expecting in those fields. Uh, our functionals made those changes on their own. They had fun with it. And now that same functional in that area is working on the payment request center and doing some similar work there um, as the users, as we implement out that. And, you know, it's in that process that we're gathering those business requirements that we know what that tool is. We feel comfortable with it now. We've been using it for a couple of years and we can really leverage it. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned, Pam, that your functional folks are using it. If you think of in years past, and I'm sure um, um, Tiger, who's been around for a long time uh, working with PeopleSoft, will be able to tell, and Larry too, that um, um, most of that stuff is usually designed for the technical person, right? We don't usually put a whole lot of time and effort into the UI for those types of components, but we've we've shifted, you know, and we've we've really thought through the design of some of those things so that a functional person can use it. Um, because these days, as we saw in the survey, some people just describe themselves as both functional and technical. And we really don't know what role in your organization could be doing that. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Pam. Yep. Um, Sally, what do, you, what do you think? You wanted to take map collections? What, what, what are your thoughts on map collections? Yes, so what we found, we actually, before we started creating the navigation collections and tiles, was we met with all our um, power users, and that was probably the most time consuming part, which is interviewing everyone to find out where they go, et cetera, and what they'd like to be included. But the actual setup and creation was, I would say, fairly easy, um, very user friendly, um, little training. I mean, we really didn't do have to do any training. People found it easy to use um, from an employee perspective and the power users. So I think just taking the time to plan out how you want it to look first. Um, but the actual creation was wasn't too bad um, on our yeah. side, and easy and to change. Did, did did you also use personalization that kind of fits along with the dashboards and the the nav collections? Anything that you allowed your end users to use as well? We don't let our end users do the personalizations. No. <laughs> You don't want them to be uh, lose their stuff, right? And then call you and, and correct. Says, where, did, where did my tiles go? Where did my dashboard go? Right? I get it. Yeah, we did. We did not give them that power. Okay, but it exists. So the right? opposite. So that's another we example did. of configuration, right? Yeah, Pam, you did. You said you did. We we allow them to personalize, and um, I I would just challenge um, if we could have as many different diverse group of users using our system like we do, uh, anyone from digging ditches in the public works to a library worker or whatever, we allow them to personalize the home pages. Um, we have delivered ones that we have kept 
um, static and they can't move the tiles on, but we also allow them to add tiles to those and to create their own home pages and add tiles. And I'll tell you, help desk calls, zero. There you go, Sally. <laughs> you take a look at that. Uh, there's also ways that uh, you can lock certain um, tiles in place so that the people don't move them, they don't delete them, you know, so that they always see that certain tiles that you find important for each employee or manager to see. You can always have it locked on the dashboard, and not let them move around. But anyway, it's a, it's a good example of how, because it's a configuration, not everybody uses it the same way. Right, and that's fine because everybody has their own appetite for that. Um, Larry, let me move to you. What's your pick? Your favorite uh, framework? I'm sure it's hard to choose, but um, yes, pick, yes, pick so many options. Like um, I'll actually go with one that's been around a little while. Um, related actions. So I'm probably one of the more functional folks on this panel. Um, some technical, but probably more functional and, and technical. And I consider related actions still something that a functional resource can do. And I guess I'll just give an example. We had a customer who was using Match Workbench, and because of their business process, they didn't have enough information for POs and receipts and a number of other areas. They wanted everything on one page. So they're going to customize it, and it was going to be significant because they needed a lot of information. They're going to have extra tabs, et cetera. So we provided an option of using related actions so to, to uh, take the information from the page. They can hit the drop down. They can go right to the purchase order. They can click on the receipt, go right to the receipt, pop up a new screen. So while it wasn't on that same screen, it provided the same net effect. And um, they avoided what could have been a very you know, a significant customization just by reusing uh, related actions. And what's great about that is you can put related actions almost anywhere inside of PeopleSoft and do things like that, pop up to another page, pop up uh, queries, uh, other information. So I consider that, uh, while it's been around a long time, very powerful to, uh, to help avoid customizations, just like the example I gave. Yep, and help with navigation at the same time, get people absolutely. where they need to get to the system. Yeah, I, yep, I, I, that's a great example, Larry. Um, Tiger, what do you think? You mentioned event mapping. You want to stick with that one, or is there another one you want to talk about? Well, yeah, event mapping and drop zones, uh, to me, are, the, to, you know, the several of the other frameworks are built on top of event mapping like the page configurator so that's kind of the basic plumbing component there um drops on zoo because that's just your basic life cycle management to me so the other frameworks are configurable to help you do certain things but how can i remove those customizations how can i the, the basic core functionality how do i get my upgrades and my updates in the system um and maintain that system um i mentioned the you know, real life scenario we had a customer that had 564 customizations and they wanted to go to the cloud they were just going in going in the, the towel and saying we're going to, to implement a customization uh, go to the cloud and they couldn't afford it so they came back and they said how can we get to the cloud and this was their solution was to use these tools to remove those customizations are lift and shift or move and improve, I'd like to say. And they did. They all but 20 of those 564 online customizations. And now it's going to be less because of the classic drop zone functionality that was released in 858. Uh, the end result was they were able to do that plus some PTF testing scripts. They are now in the cloud with a vendor managing it for them. Uh, and I, the, the savings are like 70 some percent of what it was before. They're caught up on uh, uh, palms. The, the vendor actually applies the POM for them nine weeks after it comes out. So they, they have a they have people software leading industry you know, functionality, but in a cloud service, and they're paying for it like a cloud service. So uh, yeah. that's a win-win-win to me. And it's all because they were able to get rid of all these enhancements, all these customizations, or I call them enhancements. Still changing them and delivered, but you're not impacting it via customization. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about um, event mapping and drop zones. It's been um, really um, a game changer for many of our customers, not just for future enhancements, but kind of like what you said, Tiger, going back to the old stuff that they've done and replacing it, um, um, replacing some of those customizations using that framework helps in the long run. Um, I have another question I want to get back to Tiger, but first, um, I, Christina, do you mind Popping up the the next survey, I'd like to go to the third question that I sent to you. Um, so I'm throwing you a, I'm throwing you a curve here. Yeah, yeah it's all good. 
Okay. So for the folks on the phone, the question is, which of the following PeopleSoft configuration frameworks are you most familiar with? Um, it is a multi-select, so you'll be able to select up to two of them. Page and field configurator, drop zone, event mapping, activity guide composer, or page composer. So if you guys don't mind, I just fill out that information. We'll give it 15 to 30 seconds as well. Um, it looks like several are um, familiar with page and field configurator with about 81% are saying that with page composer being the least at 4% right now. Uh, let's give it another 10 seconds or so. So the folks on the phone, don't forget, all you have to do is just click the ones you want and we'll capture it. We've got about 60% have voted now. I'm going to give it another 10 seconds and then I'm going to go ahead and close it out. So again, which of the following PeopleSoft configuration frameworks are you most familiar with? Select up to two, page and field configurator, drop zone, event mapping, activity guide composer, or page composer. So I'm gonna go ahead and close it out. I'm gonna share the results back. So what I am seeing is, so page and field configuration, 83% of the folks are familiar with it. 27% uh, on drop zones, 50% on event mapping, 20% on activity guides and only 3% on page composer. Got you. Thank you, Christina. That's very helpful. It's not too surprising. I'm guessing uh, you guys probably don't find that those results surprising either. Uh, just as an FYI, page composer is a tool that you can use to um, configure and, and update approvals and then put different content on, on your fluid approvals page. So, um, helps me understand but maybe we need to share some more information about bacon case composer right but but it's important for customers to know those top four um, because those are the ones that i feel are most flexible and based on what you guys said i think you guys find it uh, very similar um so tiger i want to get back to uh and it's kind of a question i actually got two questions like this on the chat so i'm going to kind of put them together and ask you so and and, and for the rest of the panelists i'll come around to you for what could be a downside to using a configuration framework, right? Because not everything is perfect. So um, I want to ask you, Tiger, so if you have multiple environments, which most customers do, and I'm sure as a partner, you probably support multiple environments for a customer, whether it's dev, test, production, QA, training, whatever. Um, how, how is it different if you use a, a configuration framework when you have to take those configurations and either manually enter them in each one of those environments or maybe use something like application data sets to pull, move that data over into the different environments. What do you do or what do you suggest that um, uh, your customers do when they have multiple environments and they use a configuration framework? Yeah, that, that's actually the one drawback because, you know, we're, especially with the event mapping, we were used to going in there, pulling up a component and then seeing the code right there that, that's going to run. While yeah. you can run traces, the event mapping functionality was show. Um, you, you didn't always know if you had a hello world type scenario that was done in code and event mapping. It's mapped over in, in this other silo. It's not in people tools attached to that component. There is an icon now that shows up. Um, that's something we, we actually battled with on the, some of our early, early implementations. We, we ended up creating um, some very complex reports that actually go through, uh, and again, I'm still going on the event mapping scenario, but they would go through the, all the deliver people soft events, including event mapping, and we were able to actually map out all the different code, regardless of where it came from, so that it's, it's change management. That, that's what it comes down to. How are we able to maintain and see these things? Because they exist somewhere else. Now you throw in the, the multiple scenarios where I may have changed, you know, some settings over in one environment, different settings for payroll because they have a different environment all to themselves. And how do I move all these up into the various upstream uh, environments? Uh, and active data sets are the way to do that. Uh, that's another, I don't want to call it framework, but another feature that a lot of customers don't even know about yet. Um, and it's, it's very useful. Uh, everybody's so used to data, data mover, uh, but active data, uh, Data sets are a powerful tool because they allow you to look at the data, allow you to prove it, move it, uh, merge it, uh, on the slice and dice the data, and getting this configuration moved from one system to another uh, much easier. And then PeopleSoft does deliver a lot of those uh, scripts for you or uh, the data set for you already pre-configured. So that, that's the way to go. But it doesn't it doesn't make a challenge. So you have to you know uh, we, before we actually created our our process that identifies all these changes, configuration changes. We used, uh, you know, Google uh, 
or Excel spreadsheets with tabs at the bottom documenting everything. Yeah. Um, Larry, what, what do you think in terms of uh, what would you tell a customer that's looking at um, using a configuration framework? What's something that you want to let them know before they start getting into it? Yeah, uh, obviously, you know, everything Tiger mentioned um, are, is very key, but, uh, you know, with, with a couple of things. One is um, you have to make sure that you have the expertise, right? So everybody's been doing app design or configure customizations for a long time. That skill set's there. You have to have somebody that's up to speed on, the, on what the capabilities are for the configuration frameworks, uh, because you will work within the confines of the, that tool's capabilities. And if you're going to customize, I mean, app designer is wide open. You can do anything you want. You can build on both on applications. So you're going to have the ability to configure, but it will be limited within the, the, the capabilities of each of the frameworks, whereas customizations, again, you know, wide open and you can do and build whatever you'd like. Yep. Um, Pam, um, what are your thoughts? Okay. I just unmuted myself there. Sorry about that. <laughs> so um, I so I think for us um, trying to figure out the the balance and um, we ran into some frustration when we were using Page and Field Configurator um, because we were seeing that it didn't work in all situations and and I know over time. Uh, you guys ended up improving the issues we were encountering and it had to do with you know the pages and the sub pages and everything else and so i think um it's important for people when they are looking at a new tool like that and understanding that it's not going to be perfect because you guys are rolling things out in phases as well and just because it's not perfect the first time doesn't mean you shouldn't try it, right? And I, I would say PTF is a perfect example of that as well. Uh, so as we um, as we have thought about, you know, what tool are we going to use? How are we going to use it? If we run into issues, what are we going to do? I think it's just a matter of having a good conversation amongst our team um, and figuring out where are we going to go and what are we what tool are we going to use um i would say event mapping for our organization has not um spiked at an all-time high i think our team has tiptoed in that using it and um i'm hoping that they use it more but i know they have found that it doesn't work uh in all situations for us and so evaluating and realizing no not every one of these solutions is going to be the perfect solution um, all the time. And mm -hmm. that's why you guys come up with a bunch of them for us to um, learn about and figure out which ones we should use. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And internally, I'll tell you that in our individual applications teams, our application development teams, as they look to leverage the framework, we look to push the framework as much as we can. Um, and if we need an enhancement so that we can deliver on the application feature itself, we will look to enhance the framework um so to, so if you're running into some areas where you feel like it needs to do better you certainly should let us know um because that just adds to what we're trying to do internally and just gives us more of a reason to instead of addressing the shortcoming in the application feature itself try to address it up front with the framework so that it can apply to multiple multiple um, features and to customers who are using it um, Sally, how about you? What um, what are your thoughts on what customers could, should consider or think about before they use a configuration framework? I think, you know, a lot of what everyone said, you know, there's so many different capabilities in trying to keep up with everything and doing the research and being knowledgeable on everything. Um, one example I was going to talk about, we've been using the Activity Guide Composer for um, onboarding. So the setup was easy, but then it's thinking of all the steps after now that we're looking at the security for the employees, the security for your admins, um, and the troubleshooting, all the other setup that has to be done to get mm -hmm. it to work in addition to just that Activity Guide Composer piece of things. Yeah, I think that's a good point, too, because sometimes we'll have a, a framework connect to another framework. Um, for example, an activity guide, you could have, a, you'd want to connect it to a questionnaire framework. Maybe you want to 
build out a questionnaire as part of the um, activity guide itself, right? So, and in that case, is they each have their own quirks, and you have to kind of understand how they how they ultimately uh, work together. So, um, definitely something to consider, especially if you're trying to piece together multiple frameworks together. Um, I had another question um, that kind of leads into, or kind of kind of dovetails what we just talked about. It was one of the first questions I got through chat. I apologize to that person for not getting to it sooner. But their question was, what usability feature has have you guys seen most valuable for the for you guys as customers and also for the for the partners? We talked about the dashboard and the and the tiles, which is I think that's always an easy win. That's a quick win for customers, but. What's a usability feature that you guys um, have found valuable for your customers? I'll, I'll start with you, Tiger. What, what, what have you seen from a usability perspective? Uh, yeah, the navigation is, is, you know, just usability, you know, user friendliness. So, you know, the page field configurator uh, allows you to, you know, go in there and make those, change some of those data labels. Uh, you know, you, you and I know what effective date is. You and I know what set ID is. Uh, well, actually, I don't know what that idea is, and I've been doing this for 15 years. So, um, but being able to change the label, you know, effective date is dinner and a movie. No, it's a date something becomes effective. Simply changing a label like that makes a big difference. Uh, so that's a big one. And then the, you know, the dashboards and navigation uh, content areas, being able to see all your applications but not have to navigate anymore uh, is also a big usability feature, I think, that has really been widely adopted uh, or accepted. Yeah. Interesting you mentioned that, Tiger, because there's some terminology that we use in PeopleSoft that was acceptable 15, 20 years ago from a technical perspective, and effective date to me is one of them, whereas today you don't want to expose that right to, to users because uh, particularly your self-service users um, because they don't know what yeah, that they means. You don't, they don't know yeah. what that means, and, 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 they'll, and if they'll hesitate to enter in data because they're like, wait a minute, does that mean today, today's day? Does that, you know, what does that mean? And once you have, as a self-service user, people hesitate, then they're going to pick up the phone, and they're going to call Sally, and they're going to call Pam, and they're going to call everybody else saying, what do I put in there, right? So that, that's a great point. Oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, but it's a different F7. You know, we all know what F7 was 10 years ago, yeah. but now it's <laughs> exactly. like, that's an example also. Of things you know, it's changed, but it's gotten easier. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Larry, what do you think? What's the usability? You mentioned related action, which I think is a great one. Um, is is there something, another type of usability? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit older again. It's been around for a while, but still there's a lot of, lot of people that know about it, and it's definitely usability, um, and that's drilling URLs and queries, right? So w what's everybody done with a the query? They run a query, and they write down the information that they need, then they have to go and figure out their navigation. Right? And that's very, very time consuming. From a usability factor, when you have a query and you have hyperlinks built in that query and you click on your hyperlink and it takes you to that, to that source page, it's much, much more efficient for the end users. They can save so many clicks, so much uh, time navigating. And if you build that into your queries, you can save your, your uh, internal users tons and tons of time. And that's a big usability uh, factor. And um, I, I don't see it used enough, and it certainly should be. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Pam, how about you? I would actually um, tag on to that because not only taking that query, but then going into a pivot grid and has, having that visualization of that information and being able to drill and, and to um, slice and dice the information in a different way. Uh, we see that um, being more useful for managers looking at data uh, more holistically than we do um, the end users who are doing exactly what Larry said, getting that query drilling into that um, further detail. Um, the other usability that we have implemented um, when, a few years ago when they first came out uh, was the activity guides. And we had done that in an area for our grants users um, that's not that was that's a very complicated module and our end users were very confused about what all the steps were by by having that activity guide framework we were able to create an activity guide to step every user through what they needed to do and they knew exactly if they had done it or not based on whether it was shown as green and complete or not or not complete 
Um, that was a, a great feature that was implemented for us for usability. Hmm. Excellent. And uh, Sally, how about you? I can't think of anything outside of what they said, mainly, you know, the tiles, um, the, like the work centers, the payroll and time and labor work centers, um, are probably the main ones that for us. Yeah. And you mentioned work centers, so you, you start to see a lot more from us uh, being delivering role specific navigation, right? So a work center is kind of like a one stop shop for a specific role within the, within your organization, whether it's your benefits administrator, whether it's your payroll person, your time and labor person, uh, so that they don't have to navigate the entire system. They can have everything in one place um, because they tend to spend a lot of time in, in, in PeopleSoft. So you start to see a lot more usability coming out from us on the admin side, uh, whereas we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years focusing on employee and manager self-service, but now we're looking more at the admin. So um, we're actually towards the end of our call. I don't know about you guys, but this went by very quickly. I think we could probably go another hour on this uh, stuff. I, I mean, I didn't. Even, I hardly even got to uh, a fourth of the questions that, uh, that that I had. But I'd like to end on on one last question um, and give you guys an opportunity to kind of you know let, let the audience know, uh, particularly those most most of them are functional as we know. Um, and uh, most of them are looking at using configuration frameworks. So just a, gen just a general question is, what, uh, what advice do you give um, customers looking at a configuration framework um, or any of the configuration frameworks moving forward to, to have the system do what they need it to do instead of going back and doing regular customizations? And you can use any, any experience that you have with anything you want to share. Um, Larry, I'll start with you. Um, anything you want to share, like kind of the last, last parting thoughts for our customers? You know, it's just a lot of the things that we've already talked about. It's it's stay on top of what's being delivered. Have a point person that's in, in charge of it. Make sure that everybody understands the capabilities. Start with your configurations first before you customize. And then, you know, make that a part of your process. Make sure you be as part of your design process, you have your checklist of did you try these things before you move to customization. So a lot of the things we already uh, already discussed in, in detail are, are the things that I'd still continue to do as a customer. I like the idea of a checklist. That's a, that's a, that's a good thing. Um, Pam, what do you think? Any parting thoughts for the customers? Yeah, I would suggest that people learn about these frameworks outside of when they're working on a project like getting current or upgrading their tools. Um, and I know sometimes that's difficult, but if you set aside the time ahead of time to learn, your team will feel a lot more confident in using the tools instead of always leaning back on uh, the way it always has been. Yeah, Pam, that's a great point. If you're under pressure and you have a deadline of something due tomorrow, now's not the time to learn event mapping. <laughs> you know, um, It's just, uh, you, you wanna try to do it outside that project. Um, or give yourself enough time to to learn it. I mean, these are new tools, new tools, new frameworks that uh, even we have to learn ourselves, right? Our development team has to learn them before they implement or use them to deliver new functionality. So respect how much time it does take to understand the nuances of, of some of these frameworks. I, I totally agree with that, Pam. It's a great point. Um, Sally, how about you? Any uh, parting thoughts? I was just thinking the same thing. You know, don't be afraid to go out and play with it in a test environment and trial and error. <laughs> Yeah, no, no better way to learn, at least I know for me, than trial and error. And you can always take the latest image, you know, and, and, and download that and, and use it. You don't have to just work within the environment that you have in production. Um, you can go to the, the PeopleSoft Update Manager homepage and play around with the, with the environment and, and, um, and just try things. I, I think that's a great, great um, suggestion. Um, Tiger, I'll give you the final word. What, did, what, are, you, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, I totally agree with everybody. It's been an excellent panel. Um, you know, it, some of the tools can be tough. Uh, you know, the page composer is a tough one to use. It takes a lot of practice. Uh, you know, PTF is in a framework per se configuration, but, uh, you know, it was tough at first. But it's an art, not a science. But once you get good um, at whatever the framework is, it took us a while to become good at event mapping. And so we got to the point where we knew how to do things certain ways and, and make it work rather than, you know, the straight lift and shift. We were able to accomplish almost anything. 
Um, and again, our, our goal for a lot of our customers is trying to help them remove those customizations so that they can stay current, you know, and, and really go to that cloud type environment. So it, keep at it, keep practicing, or, or go out there on the, the blogs and, and you know, uh, there's a lot of great blogs out there with great information. So do a little research, and you'll, you'll find a lot of solutions. Um, Jim Mary and Sansa, you know, we have a blog. Uh, I'm sure Larry has something out there where there's lots of tips and tricks on how to do this stuff. You just have to spend, you know, you just go ask the Google gods, and they will probably give something to you, uh, yeah. which will help you do this, uh, you know, not the way you've done it. You keep doing the same thing that you've always done, you're going to get the same thing you always got. So uh, utilizing mm -hmm these functions and tools, and they're always improving, they're getting better and better, is I think going to uh, dynamically help uh, as far as your maintenance and your level of frustration that you get good at. Yeah, no, that's a great point too, Tiger. And you know, as you look at this list, um, because we have such a strong PeopleSoft ecosystem with our partners, and we have so many customers, um, that there's plenty of stuff out there, even beyond the stuff that we publish, that talk to um, a lot of these frameworks already. Uh, many of it is, is just free, it's on YouTube, It's you do a Google search, you'll find a ton of stuff. Um, and this list may seem daunting, but um, I think you guys would probably agree with me that um, those first three, it, like if, if you had to, if you needed the most flexible framework just to know where to get started, I would start with those three because those three can lead you um, to, to do a lot of stuff. Um, maybe not everything, but it'll 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 help you with a lot of things. Um, and then the others you can just learn based on need, you know, um, if 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 should should it come up. So great great um, great advice, guys. I think that this is this is great. Um, I want to thank you, Sally, Pam, Larry, Tiger. Appreciate you being part of the panel. Uh, it's it's um, I really value when we're able to get a cross section of people like themselves that run different applications for PeopleSoft and our customers and partners, right? Because we're all in it together um, to espouse PeopleSoft as much as we can and train and educate people as much as we can. So I really do appreciate you uh, being a part of the panel. Um, Christina, I know we went over by a few minutes, but you know, that's kind of my style. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you for, uh, what you need to do to conclude this session. Yeah, I would just say also thank you guys for joining us. Um, I think the session went really well. And um, for the folks that are on the phone, thank you guys for joining us. We hope that you guys take on some of the information and resources they've provided you guys today. Um, and we will send out a follow-up email with the recording and how to access that information shortly. Larry, Sally, Robin, Pam, Tiger, thank you guys again for joining us and sharing with us. Um, we hope you guys have a great day and look forward to seeing you on another session. Have a good one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.